Okay. So we have the last session start now. Uh, the last session by Carl Scosin. Um, he will talk about the mathematics of bell inequalities, let's say. And then after that we have a coffee break. We are a little late in time. So we will have a short coffee break around in like an hour and ten minutes, then ten minutes of coffee break, and then the last talk by uh Rangier. So thank you, Carl. Thank you. Uh, well, this is uh my last talk for today and a series of lectures and it's about um, the, the topic which of course is very prominent and speaking of very prominent topics I can only advise you to read a, so a sociology paper uh, it's by Merton it's called the Matthews the Matthew Effect inside. Yeah, and the Matthew effect in science relates to the famous paper in so social Do you know this? Yeah, yeah. It's a famous paper by Merton. Merton was a very famous uh, uh, philosopher and sociologist of science. Of science. And he was and he was kind of writing that it's also true in science, the reputation of who is listening to whom, you know. You see it on this practical example now. Uh, uh, where are the, 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 the order of, you know, the hacking order. And um, this, uh, this is a science paper about science. Uh, and he was kind of saying that those who are and the Nobel Prize, uh, for the Nobel Prize are on top, and those who are not so famous are on bottom, and the who is listening to whom is determined very much by this packing order. And also, uh, if you want to become known, better work with somebody to become known, you know, and, and, and crawl up the ladder, you know, and don't give a damn if you don't listen to anybody who is below you, and just show up, make a face, they start uh, with somebody who is higher than you. Well, probably since you cannot be longer at home. I, I know that Professor Becker was very much, uh, I wouldn't say, yeah, well, I would say this all the time, that's kind of ridiculous, because he was also into mathematics, really, and not the sociology of it. But that's how things work. And you can see a practical example now in here. Okay, so um, how, how did I relate to the subject of the talk? Uh, quite late, I was uh, listening to a, uh, a seminar, uh, Professor Pitovsky uh, from the Liberal University of Germany gave in Vienna at the Indian Medical Institute. This was uh, in September, I believe. 2000, I, I looked it up for this, uh, for this data, uh, and he was giving it all, all the bad people. All the bad people. And this sounded quite dramatic, but uh, I mean, I know this stuff before, uh, but, but actually this is true, in my opinion. They are not only all, but they are maximum. And this can be guaranteed to be maximum. And uh, from there on, uh, to start the cooperation, uh, we produced the paper. I learned a lot of that. And uh, what I know now is really defined in that very, very long paper that I produced in one of the summers uh, in near Salzburg, in my, my retreat near Salzburg. Um, and this is, uh, this is, uh, this contains also, you know, I did all the efforts to, to actually produce the, the algorithm, the programs who would, who would produce the, the bell inequalities, you see? So I put the code inside of it, and it's, a, it's an archive. So the code is only in the archive. I, I was invited, when I pushed this on the server, I was invited by one of the editors of Israel A 
Das ist der Wind, die Füße Die Position mit dem Füße But uh, the fate of this paper was a little bit different. I, I sent it uh, this article and came back and all is well known and not so important and forget it. And then I was, uh, I, I know Professor Becker also has this opinion that he was only publishing something when he was in black because he was bad experience publishing in this book. So I, I published it in, in, in my Springer book later. But in the spring of book is without the, the examples of the, the, the code. So, so this really is the big paper with the code. And yeah, let, let me give you my version of the history of the subject. I don't think that, uh, that this is really cumulated history. And we will give you bits and parts of things like that. But, uh, I think, I think this is as, as comprehensive as I could make it. Bull started this basically by mentioning what he calls conditions of possible physical experience. Conditions of possible physical experience. So let, let, me, let, let me start by asking you if you would believe me when I claim the following thing. It remains in Vienna with probability one half and it remains in Santiago with probability one half and the joint probability that it remains in Vienna and in Santiago is 0.9999 or 0.1111. So would, would you believe me? If I said it's the joint probability that it, that it rains in Vienna and in Santiago at the same time is 0.9 periodic. Uh, if it rains in uh, one of the cities uh, separately taken half of the time. That's very important. Is it? The same, same as if I claim that it rains in, uh, in uh, both of the cities almost never. The question is, when would you try to believe that this full answer? This is, this is the question by me. And the Bell inequalities are nothing but the answer which amounts to linear composition of uh, correlations to physics, to a particular physical configuration. Very simple one. These are the Bell inequalities. I don't think that too many will be able then another talk, yeah, I think this will be very different. But this is at least my understanding. It is historic thing, you know? Now, of course, yeah, this, this was for God. Nobody looked at Pushkin before Pitovsky started it. This was uh, 100 years later. Then came uh, a theory called Cochet theory, which I discovered only recently. So, so uh, even I, looking for, searching for these things, discovered. And, and this was, you know, much better turned down uh, an, an invitation to evaluate the dissertation, because uh, it was the colleagues I know very well, Kulachensky and Kulmanova, uh, who asked me to evaluate a, a Slovak dissertation. And I thought, well, you know, I have to go to uh, Bratislava, but I do that for the sake of uh, the dissertation and for the sake of the colleagues, because I like them, they are nice, and I have learned uh, a lot of things, and they have explained a lot of things to me. But then I discovered that everybody was talking about crochet theory, and I had no idea what crochet theory was. So this was, uh, this was a big, big thing. Yeah? So, so the quantum logic community, the algebraists, the old, and those mathematicians involved, they all know what Cauchet theory is. And constant to speak about Cauchet theory. And Cauchet theory has a central paper by one of the authors of Bridges, who is in uh, constructive analysis. Probably you know uh, Bishop and Bridges, constructive analysis. It's a famous book uh, uh, about. Uh, 
about polytopes and how to construct phases of polytopes and how measures are constructed if you know the extreme cases of those measures. This is basically, in my understanding, now crochet theory. And then uh, came another person, another researcher, Voropeyev. He is a Russian. Uh, this paper I only know because Professor Kyushko cites him. Yeah? And Bell then popped out, I mean Voropeyev was in, in the 60s, uh, Bell also started in the, the 64. If you look at the original paper, I challenge you to do that. It's a ref mod first. You will not find the Bell inequalities there. The final Bell inequalities uh, were written down by Wittner. You know, this guy who, who I met at the lunch table in, in Sicily. He was very shy. Wittner was very shy. But he was also a moonist, I think. He, he got a lot of money from the moon sect. Uh, and he had a student with him who was, who was holding. This was very amazing to me. You know, this student, the student of Wigner, he would, uh, he would hold a little notebook and he was just writing um, trips, you know. He, uh, so he, if he wanted to go from Trapani uh, or from Palermo uh, to, uh, to Rome, he was writing Rome, Palermo, it was, was handing it over to the, to the counter. And off he went. Yeah. So they had a lot of money anyway. And due to the Reverend Moon, I believe. Uh, nobody speaks of them either, but that's, you know. Uh, and uh, the story of this uh, is in the Sakura paper I mentioned. You know? What Wittler did to the Penny in the Colleges, and so on and so on. The Bell, in, a, in my opinion, Bell did not have much understanding what he was actually doing. You know? and, and not many derivations of the Bell inequalities really go to the structural element of the, of the thing. You know? And then everything became probably clearer, but nobody read this article. Nobody reads this article even now, you know? Just Thielsen, Thielsen, from the Thielsen part, you know, uh, promotes him. He says, but Froissart has done this long time ago, you know. Froissart really was the first who introduced the polytop method to, to the derivation of the Bell and similar type inequality. And he was well aware that this can be generalized. But he is totally forgotten. It's a very nice paper, and for us all it's quite well known in the Chinese physics community. So he is not a nobody. And then came Pitovsky. Pitovsky originally derived this method independently. I'm quite convinced that I never uh, uh, looked at it, I never uh, I talked with him a lot, but I, I was not aware of the Francois paper myself, so I couldn't ask him. But, uh, but I, I realized that he wasn't even referring to Boulay in his first paper. Uh, so he developed the method and then discovered that Boulay, some, at some point discovered that Boulay has done the same thing, and he was never mentioned in Foursault. And then came other people, uh, and then came Sirilson, who was into the Foursault thing, uh, and asked why, why everybody looked at Vygotsky in front of and, uh, yeah, and then came all the other guys like me, who are trying to make, uh, to write, the, to rewrite history, revisionist history of the subject. Okay. Mm. So, it's, it's typical, because it's a good idea that has popped up in the minds of many good people. This is, this is what, uh, what I mean. And, and, and what is the idea? The idea, after what I told you, is quite simple. Take all the two valued states, and starting from uh, having these two valid states in mind, take, let's say, any kind of entity or realistic entity like correlation function, do your classical thing by assuming that uh, certain observables are, are, are independent and, uh, and, and, um, and form uh, a tuple and 
uh, with, with the with evaluations, the two valued states as, 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 as values um, uh, of, as the entries of the tuple, interpret that tuple in terms of a vector space. And then you have the extreme cases of a, of a polytope. And then by assuming that the classical probabilities are just the convex combinations of the extreme cases, look at the faces of the polytope. They have the inside and the outside. So you form, you first form, uh, you first with in mind all the two valued states, then you form yourself an arbitrary whatever you like, you know, correlations or probabilities or whatever, and uh, evaluate those probabilities on all two valued states, and for every two valued states form a tuple with entries as the two valued states states and then interpret that as a vector in a high dimensional vector, vector space we don't need in them. and consider these as extreme points because those two value states are two extreme points uh, of a polytope and then there exists a, so the first is not so famous here the uh, cost of life theory stating that uh, there are two equivalent representations of the polytope. One is in terms of the vertices and the others are in terms of the faces. And there exists a theorem in computer science which was used by Kotowski also saying that this problem to compute the uh, Faces, compute all the faces for the vertices is not is incomplete. So it's hard. But it's hard, but it's doable, and there exist algorithms for doing it. So what I did is when uh, Spitovsky we just applied this, he usually you know this guy is telling you about uh, the EPR configuration, you have the source. And uh, the source explodes. You have conservation of momentum. And you measure something here, and you measure something here. And this gives you some correlations. And then, through some of the alleged tricks, the alleged tricks are motivated by the, what is called the, 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 the high problem, you not know, completely the high. The, uh, to, to add them together in a linear way. And if you look at those quantum probabilities, and, 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 and you get inequalities. And those inequalities are obeyed because you started with two valued states by the classical thing. So the bad inequalities are totally classic. There are predictions according to the classical rule. You plug in the quantum probabilities. And voila, there you get the violations. And you know, these violations, how do they come about? The violations come about because um, the correlation functions of classical and quantum are very different, of different functional form. One is linear, it's a straight line. And the other is a trigonometric function, it's a cosine. Yeah? And this cosine is responsible. And, and please do not fall into the trap of people, you know, they are saying, oh, these magical quantum correlations, you know, somehow you measure something here and then it turns out this way. You know? I, I just sent an email to John Norton. Uh, because he, he wrote it, you know, he, he wrote, well, somehow magically, John Horton is not somebody, he's the head of the people. You know. uh, and, and we know the response. I mean, the nice thing is he responded. 
usually they don't respond. He says, thank you for reading my paper. <laughs> because I, I said, you know, this is not the magic. Because uh, I beg you, you know, if you take nothing with you, just read one paper. And this paper is by Asha Perez. Whole paper, he also included the paper, it's also contained in his book on quantum mechanics. So if you download the book, it's also a good one. It is called Anker for Experiments. Have no result. After all the experiments and no result. And there he, he considers this, this configuration. He has a bomb, you know. These are any like bombs, you know, they have this in any tour has this bomb detection scheme where they don't invest the photon sometimes. So uh, they, there is a bomb and the bomb explodes. Yeah. Classical thing. Yeah? And off there go two pieces. Sorry. This is, by the way, called the EPR argument. The EPR argument is an age-old argument. You know, Einstein, like a check in the box, tried to figure out experiments to to evaluate uh, quantum mechanics. And, and the EPR paper uh, was written actually not by Einstein but by uh, but by Ro uh, Rosen. And, and Rosen was soon off to California because he got a job in California, so they couldn't coordinate it. He went into publishing, it was PRA, and, and Einstein, Einstein didn't like the paper, the, the gist of the paper. He wrote in a letter to Schrödinger because Schrödinger, Schrödinger also didn't like the theory. So he said, oh Einstein, good that you wrote this paper. And, and Einstein you can follow this conversation. There's a famous letter now, stored in Israel. Uh, uh, he says, well, you know, Thank you for commenting so favorably, but I don't like the paper. It's, 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 he says uh, in German, uh, it is in Verschütt geraten. It's, it's, it's the, the, the content is buried under the academic talk. You know? um, <clears throat> so, so Einstein says, the problem with the quantum is that if I measure something here, the wave function collapses here. Collapse of the wave function doesn't mean that there is a uh, transfer of, uh, of information. You know, it just it just it collapses here, uh, and, and uh, it just it just gives you some outcomes which which are okay. But but the, for Einstein, the real concern was that I measure something here, and it's it's not in the it's not inside the light cone. You know, it's, it should have been outside. And, and, and uh, so something happens with the wave function here depending on, on, on this guy. Uh, and so he says, well, this is not in conformity with special relativity. So this was Schrodinger's concern. And there's a very good paper by a philosopher of scientists from Notre Dame University uh, arguing about this. And very, very clearly arguing about this. Um, I learned about this uh, Communication between Schrödinger and Einstein through that paper. Um, so, but but they introduced this kind of explosion thing, you know, and, and it was later used to uh, to get correlations. So, so uh, to go on with Paris, he says, well, here, you know, you have the you have a classic configuration, a bomb exploding, and you measure the sign of the spin. Uh, of, the, of the angular momentum. And because this has angular momentum zero, those two have to add up, so you get correlations. Yeah? Uh, so, so whenever you measure something like uh, a, 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 a angular momentum in this direction, I'm speaking about the sign, yeah? Of the angular momentum, not the angular momentum. You have to measure this because of conservation of angular momentum. And this is true for every direction. So it's a singlet density state under both theory. So you can do this, this experiment classically and everything. You know, this is 
Uh, everything you claim for, for the folklore API experiment applies to the classical system as well, you know, but there is no action at the distance, it's just preservation of angular momentum. Yeah? And, and he takes this and argues that, well, the correlation function, he, now I would have to define the correlation function. Yeah? He, uh, uh, there is, uh, defines, uh, please have, have a look at this, it's quite easy. He says, the correlation function is just the product of the single outcomes and then you sum over or, or on both sides, plus and minus, and then you sum over all these products and then, and then you average over the number of experiments. Yeah, this is, this is the, the correlation function. And from that he argues that the correlation function is uh, a straight line. So, uh, so uh, it would be that, the classical correlation function. He, he has some argument, says, well, the, uh, when the bomb explodes, this is equally distributed and so on. So he has really hands-on on the configuration. Everything is really quite interestingly uh, explained here. So, um, and, where, and where are the extreme points? The extreme points is where this is zero, where the, where the angle is zero. Uh, no, where the angle is zero, is here. Where the angle is zero, uh, because of preservation of angular momentum, you get the minus here. <coughs> and where the, when the angle is um, pi, just the other way around, you measure it along this, it gets tilted, so it gets a plus here. So this is plus one, and this is minus one. And, uh, and in between, uh, at pi over one half, we get a 50 to 50, so everything is at the correlation is zero. And in between, he argues a very nice argument, uh, uh, you get a, a straight line, classically. Quantum mechanically, if you derive the correlation function, it looks like a cosine. So, so the magic of the quantum, if you, if you press me hard, is in this region here. Here you get more plus minus pairs, and here you get more minus plus pairs. And this is responsible. These correlation functions are responsible for the violation of the Bell inequalities. Mind you, the, the correlate, the Bell inequalities are classic. It can be computed by the uh, uh, Minkowski like theorem as by solving the whole high problem, which is hard but good. And these are classical coefficients. And they are violated by such functions because the probabilities are different. And there's nothing. I mean, people make mystery out of it, you know? It's just here more clicks because the, the probability is different. So, so this is why, uh, why, uh, why one wonders that, that, that this is uh, probably because it's far away. I, I have. Uh, coach report as a coach about saying, oh, I don't know why the uh, Greenberg or one signing our paper should be so much better than the coach than our paper because we have it on one particle. We have the, the problem on one particle. They have it on three particles. Yeah. But of course, the, the funny thing is that you can make experiments because this Greenberg or one signing contains, contains a, a couple of correlations to use the So, Uh, if you do that experiment, if you do that uh, with two uh, directions here on this side, A and A prime, and you do this uh, with, two di with two other directions, B and B prime, on this side, and do the homework, do all the two valued measures, form correlations, you know, so. So A can be, uh, so A, A can be uh, plus one or can be minus one. But by the way, for two state systems, uh, the probabilities and the expectations are just a, a, a transformation part. It's just, you can easily write uh, an affine transformation. It's, a, it's an affine transformation which would, uh, which would give you the joint probabilities from the joint uh, Expectations. So, um, anyway, so uh, 
you, you get the expectation, uh, you, you take all the possibilities, you know, these are 16 possibilities, that is true or false, you know, that, that A is up, this is, the, this is the proposition, and this direction is up, can be true and false. This direction is, is up, can be true and false, and this is this, so you get 16 extreme cases. No, I think no, six, uh, two, four, eight, sixteen, yeah, sixteen. And you form the following thing, you form, just, you form all, you form all, uh, all expectations. You can do the probabilities as well, but I'm just going to do two values expectations. A, you measure A and B on one side, then you measure A and B prime, then you measure A prime and B, and then you measure A prime and B prime. Yeah? And, and you do the same way, and this is, you know, so when A is plus 1, in B is plus 1. You just have plus 1 plus 1 is 1. And, and so on, you know. So, so you, you need, but there are, there are 16 cases. A1, B1, from, from, A, from, A0, from A0 or minus 1, you know, depending on what, what, what value you give. Uh, to, uh, from all of them through, to all of them falls. 16. And this 16 give you the vertices of this correlation problem. And this so solves the high problem with the program. Uh, there is a very well known uh, Japanese, original Japanese researcher from uh, from the ETH, uh, who, who has a program and uh, was very kind of helping me with the program. Um, but there exists now a suite of, uh, of such things to correlate from computer correlations from so it's not the only one. Uh, and to solve the high problem, now the high problem is getting the traces, the inside, outside. And it turns out that we get a linear relation. As, as suggested by Boone, okay, that's it. That's the that's the Klauser Horn she won't hold in the field. Probably the way Professor Gauchy will never tell you. But he's not here, I cannot ask him. Coming back to this question, who is this in the room? Okay, so, uh, so this is the most systematic way, and then you can go on doing whatever you like, you know? Like this Kushko inequality is with the Pentagon forming several series. You get the Kushko inequality on the Pentagon, and so on, so on, so on, and so forth. That's it. Nothing more. What, what I did is, with Budovsky, I did not the two case, but I did the three case, here you have three. And I did the GHC case, which was doable. Of course, it took some time at that time, but it was doable. And what, what we didn't do is we didn't use the symmetry. This was probably one of our biggest mistakes because there were two follow-up papers saying we didn't use the symmetry. I mean, we had all these inequalities, but they, these had an efficiency they were able to derive the new ones. No? So they had some insight into the structure of those equations. So this, I, I'm citing this question. So they had all of them just like we had, but they made use of them in a better way, but nobody has used them anyway because they, they don't understand what, what these guys were doing. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> There's one thing that the experimenters don't tell you. You will see. 
this term, since it is incompatible with this, because V and V prime cannot be measured at the same time. Yeah? These terms that appear in those inequalities, they have to, me to, uh, have to be measured separately on separate particles and on separate samples. So, Salinger measures the first <coughs> term on Monday morning, the second term on Monday evening, the third term on Tuesday morning, and the fourth term on Tuesday evening. And in between, he goes home, has breakfast, sleeps, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, so this cannot be measured simultaneously. Just because uh, all those things are, I mean, these and these, not, not one of them and one of them. I mean, this is the beauty of this. You know, you can, you can measure one of them here, it, although it's not orthogonal and not collinear. You can still measure it <coughs> by way of counterfactual arguments. Because you say, if I would have measured this thing on that side, I would get the, the opposite out. You know, this is just counterfactual. Here, Einstein, Poltolsky, and Rosenkreuz, this element of physical reality. So this is one thing. And the second thing is, of course, in the the violation is just due to the fact that the functional behavior of the expectation value in quantum case is different from the linear behavior of guessing. And as it turns out, that this was the contribution of Sirensen. Sirensen gives a bound of the violation of the quantum of these equations by quantum means by 2 to the power of 2. So, ah, 2 to the square root of 2. Uh, 2 times the square root of 2. And the square root of 2 is 1.4 or something. So it's larger. So it's violated, but it's still, you know, the maximal violation would be 4. I said, uh, there are some, uh, some uh, researchers from Caltech who propose it to make a big, big exchange. Uh, and uh, with that, we can get and, and I've developed some protocol to, to do that. But in order for doing that, you need a big, big exchange. If no big is exchanged, then uh, you, can, you can only go, uh, with quantum mechanics, you can only go as fast. And people have speculated and said, well, probably there exist uh, situations and configurations in uh, physics where I can afford a maximum violation. And why is the, this violation uh, only square one, uh, two square root of two? In my opinion, it's because of the probabilities, of the quantum probabilities. You just have a cosine law, and uh, this just gives you, uh, the, you know, this is just, just like you're asking why, why why is the is the, uh, is, is the side of the of the of the right? Why is this if this is one, you know? Uh, why is this one over square root of two? Uh, this is just a reason, the old reason statement. And uh, quick, a second thing that also nobody listens. But uh, even if you publish a fusel effect, you know, um, this is a fusel effect of uh, you can you can interpret this as a quantum observer. And you can easily find a permission operator corresponding to this correlation. And then you can treat that, the whole thing, Now this is an operator. You, you can treat as a single emission operator. Yeah? And then you can ask, this is generalization of the zero synthesis. And then you can ask, well, what are the eigenvalues and what are the maximum? And uh, we did uh, 
uh, uh, did some simulation at first doing uh, some parameterization motivated by Halmosh, Halmosh book, many are vector spaces. But, but then we came up with a very naive uh, uh, um, uh, idea. We said, well, what is the maximum? The maximum. Uh, uh, it, um, uh, eigenvalue with respect to the standards. And of course, it turns out to be the Zillison part, but, but we could give maximal eigenvalues for arbitrary angles. It's not, not just the bounds that, uh, that the angles that are used by series. But all of them turned out to be, of course, as expected, smaller than the series bound. I mean, you would have calculated incorrectly if you wouldn't have to reach the series bound. So, basically, and, and you, can, you can generalize this to more configurations. You know, it's very popular now to talk about uh, to use the, the pentagram, aka the pentagon, aka the house, and speak about uh, which coordinate. These are just the same. I mean, there's one ingredient more which I have told you, you know. For those inequalities, um, you have only so many two radial states. So we just figured out in the morning that there were 11. Uh, and you have to uh, to take uh, your, your extreme points for every for, for every one of those eleven. Evaluate the, the correlation function, solve the high problem, and there you go. If you want an explicit example, just go to my to my paper and plug it into the CDD plus of um, of. Uh, Fukuda uh, from the ETH and, and out, uh, out of uh, the usual inequalities. And there have been just just as a name dropper, there have been so called uh, contextual contextual inequalities. That is uh, something very much promoted by uh, uh, Adam Capello produced the first reflector with contextual inequalities. And the contextual inequalities are a generalization of this by assuming that uh, the admissibility criteria are just not existent. Yeah? So you, you can have this, you can have much more two-valued measures, so you still have a two-valued measure. You can have zeros and ones on the atoms, but these two value measures can in principle be true on all of those, or just on two, or on none, you know? Of course, then the number of two value measures explodes, you know? If you have n atoms, this gives you two to the power n two value measures. They, they are just uh, context independent because the intertwine are still yet identical, so there is no dependence on the context. So if you are willing to allow giving up two value, the original notion of two-valued measures and just say, I can have, I can throw in one particle in the interferometer and outcome to all three, you know? I don't think that this will make sense. Doesn't it? Because I truly believe that you are in trouble when the three are the outcome. Yeah. Uh, uh, then, then, you can derive, then you have much more. You get a huge number of, I uh, mean, you get, I think here are, I don't know, 18. So we get to the power 18. I solved that and because I first couldn't believe what he was doing. You know? And I got uh, his inequalities. That's it. Thank you. Question. Why are you talking about it? You, at, at the beginning of this, you talk to you. 
set up the, the collapse of the wave function uh, imply that uh, you uh, measure in some part or people say that you know the uh, you would never say me the collapse of the wave function. <laughs> never ever I would say this. Mm -hmm. I didn't say this, but people say it, yes? The, the okay. what, what, I, what I, I, your... I, I, I heard that. Yes, yes, please, give it to me. <laughs> the, 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 the collapse of the, in the measurement, the yes. collapse of the word function. Yeah, but, but you say that you never said that? Ah, I said this in the first, uh, in the first lecture. The, the people say that there is a hypothetical uh, um, non-unitary state evolution uh, according to from and from Anon proposed this. Yeah, uh, right. This is part two. And, and, and Everett has it in his red book, yes. I mean, people believe in collapse. There is exist okay, collapse yeah, that, that, models, but these are exotic. I, I, I wouldn't. I, 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 I think the, the same, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that yes. is what I'm going yes. to ask you. No, I, I think, I think this well, we, uh, everything is there already. We have the unitary evolution. I personally, if you press me hard, I would say that uh, if our, our, the, 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 the so-called collapse is not is only um, convention and then yeah. only paper because because you get so much information from the outside and you can you cannot effectively reconstruct the wave function in in general. I mean, there exists this uh, quantum erasure, erasure paper, brilliant by Seidinger. And uh, the, the suggestion how the Bell experiment is Kali has, so quantum optics people suggested that, that you can reconstruct. But only in very, you know, there, there's, a, there's also a good paper by Ascali and um, uh, the head of the Singapore group. Um, he's very outspoken. He almost shouts at you if you, if you listen to him. He says, We don't need more from <laughs> what we have already. You know? Um, a very good paper. It says uh, it's the Humpty Dumpty paper. So, uh -huh. so if you if you if they calculate it explicitly, if you push a neutron or an electron to a stern gallop, is it possible to reconstruct it in the wave function? It's like it's like attempting to Humpty Dumpty. You know, when he goes over the edge, it's there, and it's very difficult to get him back again. This is the Humpty Dumpty papers. There is two Humpty Dumpty papers. Very nice papers. Question. No more point. Any other questions? No. So my question is. Uh, uh, okay, I I think I got pretty well with the ideas of the in the discrete terms. And just like a few wonders about what happened when one has a uh, counter axis, counter uh, infinite dimension space, or uh, uncountable uh, dimensionality. Because that when you first introduce the Gretsch diagrams, I immediately thought of what would be a circle with all its points being an axis. So uh, everything will be yeah. uh, intertwined with us, like continuously intertwined. So what? How? How does it look? Like to me, it's really hard to imagine. I, you know, I, I think in I, one second, but I, I think it's I, I think one has to take into account two things. Uh, uh, starting from your example, which you explicitly mm -hmm. uh, uh, gave me yesterday, you know, uh, you have this and this and this. Uh, if you look at discrete angles. Um, you still get the star-shaped configuration, mm -hmm. you know, one in the middle and the other. Yes. Uh, but, but really, this star is an illusion because uh, by assumption you get the Hilbert space, the full Hilbert space, yes. uh, with, and there you probably need completeness. It's even complete against Cauchy sequences. So you get the continuum of things. Yes. So yeah, you, this yeah, well, half, uh, you get a, a plane. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, so, so you get really a continuum. So, so what I took out of this and what Spe Coach and Specker and what all these guys taking out are just 
uh, extremely meager parts of it. Yeah. They, they use these clouds to, contract, to construct what they like to construct. Yeah. And, and as I said, you know, the, the issue is, I'm going probably to speak about this also in the, in the, at the conference, the issue is really, if you on purpose can construct all kinds of things which lead you all kinds of results, so you get an arbitrariness, but you, you take, you pull it out of this continuum. Yeah. But it's really, the, the quantum logic is huge, it's continuous. You know, as I say, even with this Chinese lantern, they always show you this, but if you take an arbitrary measurement position, the lantern is a continuum. And this, of course, can never be reached by automata. Yeah. So that, that's a little, uh, say, the scriptive power difference yeah. between automata and, and the theoretical lattice. But, uh, but for, you know, this is what the Viennese uh, <coughs> community have taught me. In reality, if you do experiments, you can only make finite experiments. But you can say this tooling, you know, this tape can but be always very long, so the finiteness can be always very shifted. At the very beginning, there was a connection by Professor Monsal that in my vague little understanding of quantum field theory, you have a, a different place in the screen is orthogonal to, the, to its vicinity. So then you will have a, a, like, a, so, like a continuous of, uh, of orthogonal points in the Gretschy diagram. So yeah, if you, if you have an infinite dimensional Hebrew space, then, then I don't know what happens to Gretschy diagrams. That, that was my question, actually. Yeah. How does all yeah. this uh, mindset look? And if we cannot go to the continuum, let's move to the countable infinite. So put a, like a like countable infinite. And if if that would add up some something new, I, that's, I, that's my I don't my I don't believe that because uh, well first of all I can say well I take just finite hyperplanes and then I do whatever I like to do with them. You know, fi finite dimensional hyperplanes because mm -hmm. I can. I can take the subspace, uh, two dim three dimensional subspace out of uh, two powers 100. But, uh, but I, my, I would strongly suspect that if you, if you make the dimension arbitrarily long, uh, the, the proofs will all collapse because there are so, two, so many two valued measures on these structures that they become quasi classical. Yeah, th but this is a guts feeling. This is no uh, because because with, with every dimension gives you more freedom. The, you know the, the issue is you uh, you can have more stri more let's say uh, the triangle can be realized in three dimensions, uh, four dimensions. Not in not uh, in the axis, faithful auto normal uh, orthogonal representations of graphs. Uh, in, in dimension four of the triangle graph, but not in, in three. Uh, but you want as slow, uh, as compact, to, to keep the dimension compact, and you want to have as many connectors as possible uh, in order to, uh, to contain the, the cloud, you know, because it will then, and, 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 and also the, the two valued measures on this cloud, they will, they will, the, the, there are so many of them, and, and uh, effectively you will be able to separate because there are so many. Yeah. Uh, you will be able to separate them, and then you are ending up with uh, uh, classical, quasi classical configurations, which you don't want. I mean, in quantum mechanics, you don't. You want to push this to the extreme. Yeah. Pitovsky in his theorem, Specker, and also we, we try to push this to the extreme. So keep the dimension low and uh, intertwine as many uh, contexts in a, in, a, in a clever way so that you reach your goal. But the, my, my feeling is now, you know, after so many years of contemplating this, that, that there is so much arbitrariness in the choice of clouds you have that, that basically you can prove almost anything. 
And if you can prove almost everything, you really prove nothing. You know, because because people give you the impression that there's the end, the starting point and the end point, and this end point needs to be zero classically. But that's not true. You choose another quantum cloud; it needs to be one. You know. This is, I think, this is this is demolishing the whole business. But people are not arguing about that, in my opinion, because it would probably make the whole area problematic. I mean, if I would be narcissistic, now I'm narcissistic, I would say, I can talk about it because I'm at the end of my career. I don't need it end as much as, uh, as, as, as... And also, I'm, I'm, I really am... The, in the pursuit of truth. Now, now everybody will tell you he or she is in the pursuit of truth. But I really am, you know. This is the proof by authority or by, by, by seduction. And, and also, the problem is if you are younger and you are still in the field, if you say that all of this is not it's arbitrary, uh, you have to change the field, basically. You know? But I, I think, so I. But I, I wonder, you know, you know, this comes you know, usually, you know, the, this problem only appears because I realized that you can have uh, this uh, starting point and the end point with identical starting and end point. You know, it makes it clear for because because usually you say, well, you have the specker back, and there you have a starting point and end point. But the, the, this this gives you a diff, and Cabello gives you the criterion. You know, and before Cabello there were many predictions and so on and so forth. Also by Pitovsky about this. Um, and, um, and, and then you have another diagram with another end point, another one, necessarily other. But, but once you have the freedom of construction of using the same end points as we did, you know, you know, this is in your head only. The entire quantum cloud that is interpreted classically is in your head only, sorry. Yeah. This is uh, exactly what Specker meant when he spoke about infotherapies in this planet uh, cloud. So, Professor Kalsch has arrived and we will all get... So, before uh, I propose the session with that, thank you. Yeah. It was a real, a real pleasure to have these, uh, these sessions, four sessions yesterday, three sessions today. So thank you everyone for coming to the Spotsil uh, course on quantum logic. And now we have a, a sort of historical appendix of uh, what has been quantum theory. But before that, we will go for a little coffee break and introduce Professor Grandier to give us the historical account of the experimental side of what we saw uh, to, on these two days. So thank you, Professor.